date that my family and I will never forget. It was actually my daughter's fifth birthday, but the 2nd of October 2012 was also the day I started to lose my sight. Back then, I was married, I was living in London, I was juggling a tough job as a TV producer, house, kids, life was crazy. But all of that was about to change. Imagine waking up one morning, and as you open your eyes, you realize something is very wrong. Because the world doesn't look like it should. Because all color has drained away. And before you know it, you're rushed to hospital. But nobody there knows what's wrong with you. And so you're left to watch and wait in horror, as over the next 72 hours, your own sight fades away. It's kind of like someone's taking a dimmer switch and they're slowly turning it down until suddenly you're left in the dark. And then it hits you. You've gone blind. And that's exactly what happened to me. And the doctors didn't know if my blindness was temporary or if it was permanent. And they said, you'll just have to wait. Overnight, I became the mystery patient. All they knew is I'd suffered a rare neurological illness. Overnight, I'd gone from chasing my kids in the park to lying in a hospital bed, unable to see. So try to imagine you're trapped in this dark, horrible place, and fear and anxiety start to take over, and your body begins to shake. What would you do? But this talk today isn't actually about what happened to me. It's about how I responded to what happened to me. But to explain that, I need to take you back in time, back to my 20s, when I was a little bit stressed out with my job. And so I persuaded a friend of mine to come with me to a Buddhist retreat. Now, she did question that choice, but I told her it's a good idea. And she was right. We didn't get into the chanting bit, but I did get into the meditation. And in fact, the mind tools that I started to learn about, because I could really see how they could help my, well, my mental well-being. And they became part of my coping strategy from then on. Now, I'm absolutely no expert, but I've come to know what works for me. And I'm so grateful that I do, because we never know what's around the corner in life. And I had no idea about what was going to happen to me on my daughter's birthday. Now, trauma affects everybody differently. For me, I dived down deep inside myself and I accessed all of those mind tools that I collected throughout my life and my brain put them to work because it was up to me. No one else could change the way I felt. And I had to find a way to mentally survive. And so, <sighs> the first thing I did was breathe. Not just any old breathing, but a slow yogic breathing. And that calmed my body, and it gave me some mental space. And from there, I used visualization. Inside my mind, I created a mental sanctuary, this mental safe place that I could retreat to. And I used mindfulness meditation, and I mentally pushed away those feelings of fear and anxiety. And it took a lot of time and a lot of mental effort, but those mind tools helped keep my fear at bay, and they helped stop my body from shaking. But don't be deceived. Trauma is a train crash inside your head. There were times when I didn't know if I would survive, but I did, and I'm here. And yet, I'd found something amazing about myself, about what I had inside of me. I kind of came to realize that Meditation had become my own personal antidote.
to trauma. And I thought this was pretty cool. And I wondered if there was a way I could share it. And so I started on a crazy journey. I reinvented myself. No more was I going to be this mystery patient. From now on, I was going to be patient H69 because I wanted to find out and investigate. I wanted to understand the science of meditation, the science of my visual system, and the science of myself. And so, one of the first things I started to do in 2013 was write a blog. Now, this wasn't as easy as it might sound because whilst I had some sight returning, I still couldn't see very much. So as I typed away in 36 point, I wondered if maybe those giant words might one day become a book. But pretty soon, words weren't enough because I didn't just want to tell this story. I, I wanted to show it. I wanted people to experience it. So I started to think about how art and science could work together to somehow visually represent what meditation looks like. And so, I was starting to have some pretty large-scale ideas. And it was around this time I realized I needed a bit of help. Ideally, help from a neuroscientist. Now, finding a neuroscientist is not easy. And I wouldn't say I officially stalked Dr. Tristan Beckenstein at Cambridge University, but my emails did follow him all the way to Australia and all the way back again. I was persistent. Eventually, he scheduled a call with me for 10 minutes, which lasted two hours, because it was a meeting of minds, because he didn't just get what I wanted to do, he knew a way we could do it. We wanted to create a fun public engagement exhibition, where we would invite members of the public to put on EEG headsets, we would record their live brain data whilst they meditated. So in turn, we could show them their own mindful brainwaves in action. But we had to stop and think for a moment. If we did this, what might they discover about themselves? Now, I've learned just a few things about my brain over the last few years, and I now have enormous respect for my cognitive hardware. And we all know what a brain looks like, right? The gray, bumpy thing up here. But have you ever seen a brain in action as this incredible electrical machine sparking millions of neurons all the time, and yet all of that activity happens without us knowing it? We're not conscious of our brain activity. But this is the key. Dr. Beckerstein can measure that brain activity using EEG. Electrodes attached to the scalp, as you can see here, record our live brain data. And this gives our inner blueprint. And that brain activity is then exported into the brain waves you can see. Now, we all display four main types of brainwave, and they range from slow to fast frequencies. But no one brainwave is better than another. They all work together in harmony, and collectively, they represent our state of mind. So what I wanted to do was to take those brainwaves and translate them into something magical, into something beautiful, into moving art. Because if we can see and understand those brain waves, then we can see and understand our own state of mind. So, video designers from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama came on board and they helped me do exactly that. We started with beta. Now, beta is the highest frequency. This is now translated into these red flashing animations. Now, Beta brainwaves are most present when we're very high alert and active. You might be late and you're running to catch a bus. 
Or to be honest, I am probably presenting quite a lot of beta brain waves right now. Coming down the scale, we've got alpha brain waves. Now, alpha brain waves, now represented by this green organic animation, are most present when we're more restful, we're calm, we might be reading a book or brushing your teeth. Coming down the scale, we've got theta brain waves, now represented by these yellow butterflies. And theta is when we're feeling very drowsy, half awake, half asleep, and really quite meditative. And then we have delta, these blue halos. And delta brain waves are most present when we're very deeply relaxed. In fact, a deep, dreamless sleep. And then our combined image, because this is all of our brain waves working together like one big brain orchestra. So now we had it a new visual language for EEG. But there was one more thing. We were giving our participants just five minutes of a guided mindfulness session. The big question we had was, would five minutes be enough time to change the way they felt? We launched at the Cambridge Science Festival, and we converted an art gallery into an exhibition space and we hooked up members of the public to EEG machines and recorded their live brain data in a sensory controlled area. And I have to say, for a very busy event, we had over 120 people come through. For a packed out event, we had a very, very relaxed audience. So I'm kind of hoping, after all of that, that you might like to see one of the brains from our exhibition. Would you? Good, because I happen to have one. <laughs> so all of our participants' data was kept anonymous. Um, so today, I'm just going to call the brain I'm going to show you Ted. Um, but this is a real person, and we did record this live brain data at the exhibition. So what I'm going to show you is a film side by side. So, on the left-hand side, the baseline is pretty much what it sounds like. This is for comparison purposes only. So Ted was hooked up, and he's just sitting, resting with his eyes closed. He's not trying to meditate. On the right-hand side, you've got the meditation sequence. This is where Ted is actively trying to meditate. So what you're looking for is the differences between those two films. Now, I'll just signpost, because this is a very short clip. Um, Brains move fast. So look out for, on the left-hand side, on the baseline, the amount of red, high-energy, high-activity uh, brain waves in comparison to how many of the theta butterflies are present on the meditation sequence, theta being the very drowsy, meditative brain waves. So we'll go. And straight away, hopefully you can see the amount of red beta on the left and that cluster of the theta brainwaves on the right. And that's a great place to stop, because you can really see the differences. And this gave Ted something real, some tangible evidence that he could meditate, because Ted wasn't an experienced meditator. I got to show him his own brain activity, translated into moving art. And he got to see for himself that resting is not the same as meditating, but that five minutes is enough time to start making changes to the way he felt. And he got access to a part of himself that he admitted he hadn't always paid that much attention to. Ted and the other participants, through their experience and through mine, got to see and understand that fear and anxiety are not these things that happen to us. 
It is, the own way, it is the way that our own mind is responding to the events happening in our lives, and we have choices. This project started off telling my story, the story of patient H69. But I love that somewhere in the middle of that exhibition, it became the story of everybody that walked through the door, and I really hope it can continue to go on and do that. When I went blind, nobody knew if my sight would ever return. It did, but it took over a year, and it didn't all come back, and I am now partially sighted. Losing my sight was the most profound and devastating experience, and yet it allowed this project to happen. For me, a patient, to work directly with a neuroscientist, to allow us to show Ted the art of his own mind. Over the last few years, I've been told that on the whole, patients don't talk very much. But I guess I do, because asking questions and being curious has opened so many doors for me, not least in helping me understand the incredible ability of my own brain. And as I come, to the end of my talk today. I'm going to leave you with Ted, actually, as he stood at the door of our exhibition, leaving, looking very thoughtful. And he turned back to me and he said, thank you. I feel like I've just met my own brain today. 